I'm the... Okay, please take your seats. We want to start soon. Okay, good morning. Welcome to this uh, press conference uh, and book launch uh, about a book uh, we at C4 have been producing. It's called Transforming Red Plus, Lessons and, C and New Directions. Um, my name is Christopher Martius. I'm the team leader for climate change in C4. And I have a few of the editors of the book with me and they will give you a brief presentation uh, on some contents of the book, not all of it, uh, after which we are going to have a question and answer session. There's also, there might be question, uh, questions coming in online. Uh, we are trying to capture them and, and uh, feed them back to the, to the audience. Um, you have seen probably outside a banner where you see the cover of the book, Transforming Red Plus. It's about 300 pages. You only have maybe seen this flyer, which is a two-page flyer, just uh, so if you don't want to take the book with you, we have a few copies over there and in the, on that table. You find uh, an online link to download is it as a PDF. Um, and we also handed to you a press release, which also has, the, has a QR code. Um, so the people who are going to introduce the book are here sitting to my uh, left side, Professor Arald Engelsen from uh, School of Economics and Business in the Norwegian University of Life Science in Aarhus, Norway. Uh, he's the lead editor of the book and he will give you a brief overview and after this we will have my colleague uh, Veronique de Sie or Nikki de Sie who's from Wageningen University in Holland or the Netherlands, sorry, um, and she will report on one of the chapters of the book that she edited. So you get a little bit of an insight of what we have to offer, and then we can discuss. So I'd like to give the floor to Arald now. You have to move this one. Good morning. Okay, good morning. I'm happy to present the result of uh, a few months of very hard work in this book that has come to, to life in the form of a hard copy and of course, equally important on the, on the web. So this book is based on about 10 years of a major research program called the Global Comparative Study of Red that is led by CIFRA and Partner. The most impressive figure, and the one to remember, is that we have almost 500 publications from, from that project. So it's built on fairly substantial and, and very broad-ranging research in this book. It's also the fourth in a series of edited volumes where we try to take stock of red and see where are we and where should we go. Um, our approach has been kind of what we call constructive critique, that we are critical to how red is unfolding, are critical in the way that we should not have a particular agenda to promote red or be against red, but we look and ask a very simple question, does it work? At the same time, we have highlighted one of the chapters that, that Chris is, is, was leading on the importance of distinguish between red as an objective and red as a framework. So we are strong supporters of red as the objective. We need to reduce emissions from tropical forests in order to reach um, the two degree, or even more so, the one and a half degree. Uh, on the other hand, we have red also being used as an umbrella term for all the actions, and those are the actions that are aiming to reach the red objective that we kind of put under close scrutiny in the book. <clears throat> what kind of the title is transforming red and we need to transform red to be transformational and we note that there are a few changes in the 
our global environment that has made it. We have the Paris Agreement with the national determined contributions that are at the center stage, need to incorporate them into that. We have chapters looking into that. We have the changing global political climate that you all know without going further into that, if climate deniers in high offices that makes the gap between what we should do and what is seemingly politically possible to do, that gap is, is, is uh, widening. And we have read itself, we have learned a few things about red, uh, but less than we hoped, so there is also need for some expectations management. Four parts of the book, first looking at the building blocks, particularly finance, we look at the national politics and coordination problems which was centered because RED was supposed to be more than project. It was supposed to be a change of national policies and being that type of transformational change. A third part, assess the impacts. Has RED worked or not, both at national and the subnational projects? And then we look at four evolving initiatives related to jurisdictional approaches, to the private sector pledges that has been made, climate smart agriculture, and also forest and landscape restoration. If I just were to summarize red, a lot has been done compared to the pre-red period. We talk about one to maybe up to three billion US dollars per year in international funding. In, on top of that, of course, or maybe not on top, maybe at the really the, the basis is all the costs that are covered by red governments and the communities that is normally not accounted for or credited in the debate. At the same time, result-based payment, which was supposed to be a, the key and innovative feature of RED, has largely been untested at scale. There has not been sufficient funding, and to make a result-based payment system is extremely complex, and there are many issues, and it may be subject to some political gaming in the way that, that you are cherry-picking numbers to generate results. We also have a chapter looking at that. Um, on the there's maybe the main success of RED, I would say, has been in, in, in the in form of a number of intermediate outputs and outcomes. It has, of course, gained a lot of prominence on international at COP meetings and at national policy agendas. More than 50 countries both have, have national RED strategies and also include RED into their, their policies and a number of projects. Let me just go quick. In the impacts, maybe to summarize that, the main story there is modest but overall positive impacts of both policies. So modest meaning that the effects are smaller than we thought, than theory suggests, than we hoped, but they are still on the positive side overall. It seems at least in those areas we are work, we have avoided this kind of but this large and negative effects that one sometimes hears stories about and sometimes fear. So we have what, what is in development aid literature is known as the micro-macro paradox that we see a few small positive stories on the ground at local level, but they don't aggregate up to really sh be a game changer and a shift in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the overall deforestation trends. Uh, how do we explain this modest outcome? And that is a very, very kind of important debate. Are we to blame red? Are we to blame, say that it has been too little? Or do we say that the kind of using the medical metaphor that the disease has progressed too far uh, in the way that the economic interests in continued forest conversion are so strong and we have not been able to really address those underlying drivers? Or, a more optimistic view, recovery is possible, but just give the patient a little bit more time. Uh, to assess that argument in one way, you can say that words are cheap, and, and we have done a bit of the wording and making nice policy documents, but towards comprehensive uh, action, we haven't yet fully started on that. Just to sum up, how can we make RED more effective? I think we are seeing the limits of projects, of subnational. So what is needed and we call for is big and bold initiatives uh, that, that really change the underlying incentives for, 
for uh, that, that kind of leads to continued forest conversion. Examples are Brazil's drastic deforestation reduction post 2004 that was due to a number of, of, uh, of uh, national policies that changed the basic incentives in terms of stronger enforcement of protected areas, agricultural credits that were changed. India's ecological fiscal transfer is another one that has the, where you base the transfer to the, to the subnational units based on the forest cover and therefore create a strong incentive for them to conserve them. Finally, a positive, exciting narrative on forests. The iron law of climate policy says that if there is a conflict between climate and economic development, climate loses. So how can we build this? A couple of points. About a fifth of the income in forest communities comes from forest. So they are important for economic development, for livelihoods. We have also had some exciting last 10 years or so on bio pumps or aerial rivers that forest causing rainfall and trans transporting uh, moisture from the oceans to the interior land. And the final is a plea to be brave and assess impacts. Impacts assessment requires a certain bravery because you, as a proponent, you're not in control of the conclusion. And we were kind of surprised how little impact assessment that has been done. Uh, we need to know more about what works and what not, and we still do not have the evidence, for example, to tell which policies are more effective than others. So, be brave and dare to assess impacts, is one of our conclusions. Okay. Thank you very much, Errol. Uh, we go directly to the second presentation, and then we take questions uh, uh, afterwards. So, Nikki, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just want to highlight some key messages from the chapter on information and uh, policy change. Can you change for me? So I lifted this sentence from the book because I think it shows very well what this chapter is about. So we were basically saying, while information itself can be a tool for transformational change, you know, its generation, the presentation, the use are part of a political process and often a power game. So we chose a specific case on information on drivers of drivers and underlying causes of deforestation because we think this information is very can be very valuable in a policy process. For example, to identify the key causes, to, to look at different policy options and their impacts. And there's a lot of new information technologies that offer new opportunities, but they also come with diverse implications and new risks. And, you know, always having more and better information does not necessarily guarantee that there's more transparency, participation, empowerment of certain stakeholders or more accountability. So what we, what also came out of this 10 years of research is that, you know, there's a powerful influence of, of dominant business as usual uh, actors that have certain interests and they determine what and how information is generated and what is, what is visible in the policy arena and what is on the agenda basically. And actors of course have also different capacities and resources to access, process and provide information, but also you know, they have different capacities and resources to contribute to policy decisions about Red Plus. And what we also see is that if you're looking at national forest monitoring systems and what they do beyond the, the, the technical um, activities is, you know, there's a lack of mechanisms to really ensure that there is coordination and data exchange between ministries and sectors, uh, but also, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of different actors you know, are there uh, mechanisms in place for transparency? Is there timely access to information? But also, are there mechanisms in place for stakeholder participation, of for example? Um, so we think that we guidance and also financial support is needed to really move from technical data to actionable information and ultimately also effective red plus interventions and um, like i just said these monitoring systems also need to address these participation transparency accountability and coordination to counteract these differences in the capacities and resources and also this uh, difference in decision-making power and political power of these various stakeholders. This will not 
happen on its own just by having more and, and better or sufficient information. So I think that's some of the key messages from this, uh, this one chapter. Thank you, uh, Nikki. Thank you very much. Um, so this is really a very, very short overview of, of, uh, of the book and particular of one of the chapters on drivers. Uh, as I said before, for those that have come a bit late, uh, we have a few copies of the book in the back and uh, also there is a flyer where you can find the, the online uh, modality to download it in, in a QR code. Um, so if you are interested in the book and you don't want to carry a lot of weight, then just download it from, the, from our webpage. Um, I'd like to open the floor now for questions and comments from the audience. There's one. Hello, my name is Gert from uh, Planet Amazon. It's a French NGO. We're working closely with indigenous people for, from Brazil. And uh, we know that uh, some NGO and the government and uh, with the help of the German go government as well uh, are implementing a red, proje red press project at the moment. And there is a, a big concern there about the way this project is our dividing community as well. And I don't know, have you heard about uh, what happened with uh, the Surui people in Brazil? So do you have that concern also about uh, the fact that red project can be something that can divide indigenous communities? Is, is it explained in the book? I, I want to know if you, if you, you have studied this, this, uh, this concern. Um, somebody wants to answer this, or maybe we also have a few of our other editors in the room if uh, they want to take the, the mic. Yeah, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Duchel from C4, and I was one of the editors of the book. I think your question really highlights, especially with the Surui project, really shows the limitations of Red Plus projects, actually, because in that case, that project was really not able to overcome the major drivers of deforestation and degradation in that region. And so even with the best intentions, the most participation, kind of actually a pretty good project when you think about it relative to many others, it still was not able to overcome sort of these bigger changes that were happening. And I think that's what it really emphasizes the importance of these jurisdictional approaches where you're really, you know, government led, bigger scale, um, at, at subnational and national levels. So that, 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 that is a really important lesson, I think, from that project. And the other thing about dividing communities, I mean, I think that is a really important issue, and it's not only limited to red projects. I think any sort of conservation intervention that's a, you know, affecting local people will, does have the potential to, to, you know, communities are heterogeneous, we know that. And a lot of the work that we've seen is that those who participate most in conservation interventions are those who are, my, um, they're, they're better articulated, they're often wealthier, the poor, often the women in the communities are not completely engaged in these things. So I think you have a very important point about addressing that heterogeneity on the ground in any intervention. Thank you very much for that question. Any other comments or questions? Please, the lady in the blue. Yeah, you are mentioning the, oh, I'm a student from Singapore, Yale and U.S. College. Uh, I'm, you were mentioning how the information, the framing of information is a political process, and I'm wondering, like, how did you choose to frame the information for your book? Like, um, what kinds of narrative do you hope to um, kind of tell through the book? Yeah. You want to take that? So the question is what kind of narrative we are promoting in the book, given that the data uh, uh, or information generation process is a political process? Yeah. I, I think uh, part of it is also bringing together the technical community with the community that is more worried about things like stakeholder participation and accountability and transparency. and. I come more from the, the technical side, the, the satellite monitoring and working within this global comparative study on Red Plus, I work with political economy scientists and it made me realize that, you know, it's, there's, 
really implications to technical decisions that are made. And, you know, this, this uh, very optimistic view or just let's generate more information, uh, that's, that's not going to solve certain problems. That's not necessarily going to empower um, more people. And I think that's the narrative or the message that we want to get out there. It's just be aware that also in, if you have an MRV system or a monitoring system is that, you know, you have to involve not only the technical experts, you have to involve a wider range of stakeholders and really think about, you know, how, who is accountable for what, um, who has what role, but also how are we going to coordinate this? How do you balance these different powers and, and different decision-making uh, processes? I think that's the, the message that we want to get out there. Uh, we, we are, just to add to this, we are, we are making the case, of course, that, uh, and Harold has said that, that there is very little evidence so far about the performance of Red Plus, unfortunately, because not many uh, actors out there want to do this. Uh, they don't know how to do this, they don't have the funds to do it, or they don't have enough understanding how to do it right. And so we need more data, and at the same time, everybody needs to be aware that data, of course, are also the function of a political process. So you need to look at the data. You, you need the data, but you need to look at them also with, with care and with understanding. Thanks, thanks for your comment. I think there was uh, somebody in the back, yes? Hi, my name is uh, Clea Paz. I work in, in UNDP's climate and forest team. Uh, I just have a question regarding the, the if, if you were able to look at, because um, I think people talk about Red Plus and, and not necessarily are talking about the same thing. There are the project level forest carbon project interventions that are linked to the voluntary carbon market. There are the subnational jurisdictional approaches that are at the state level and that look at leakage in a very different way than project level intervention. And they are the national work that are doing things that are perhaps uh, very different. They're looking at the policy framework, they're looking at the driver's analysis at the, at the national level and building up monitoring systems at a national level. And I, I think one of the key mistakes, having worked on this for the last uh, 10 years, the, one of the key lessons is that we've been talking about these three levels of interventions as they were the same thing, and they're definitely not. Uh, and, and I think it's very important uh, that the, the scientific community contributes to clarifying these differences and, and to, to really putting out uh, the lessons in a differentiated uh, manner. I think there's been a lot of progress at a national level. Of course, there's been, uh, we're still far beyond the, the targets of really addressing drivers uh, as we should. But there's been a lot of progress of building up uh, national monitoring systems, for instance, in more than more than 30 countries have really have a concrete progress. And that's different than what's happening at the project level, what we have seen over and over that, uh, the, the, you know, it's not cost efficient to build a project level monitoring system. And that's an important lesson, and we, we should already start, you know, uh, uh, talking about these issues after so many, so, so all of these years. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> I take that mainly to be a, a, a good comment, uh, and I agree with you. There are these th three or maybe four levels if you take the, the jurisdiction of subnational between the national and, and the local level, um, and it's not always easy to to kind of just we say we should experiment at project level and what are the lessons for national level because it's a different set of policies that that are relevant at the national level compared to the local level. Uh, and what we have seen, for example, is in the tenure chapter, tenure and rights, that look at a lot of projects have tried to address the tenure issues, but if you don't have the, the national framework in place, you, you quickly realize the shortcomings of that. So in the ideal world, these are working in synergy, so, so you have national policies enabling and supporting the local action and, and vice versa. Uh, but I think your point is generally well taken, I agree. Um, so there is one comment here in the front. Is there anybody else who wants to make a comment? We, okay, second, okay. So please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm Kok Chung from Singapore. A uh, quick question on um, 
what do you see to be the interaction between Red Plus and Article 6, especially on EATMOS? Like, for example, how are the lessons from Red Plus influencing the rules that are being sorted out in Article 6? And how are the discussions in Article 6 influencing what sort of reforms that are needed in Red Plus? I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on, the, uh, on this negotiation going on here. Uh, are the lessons being implemented and, and ruled and informed um, partly, but I think, for example, in the result-based payment chapter where we kind of call for a clearer rule book on how to set reference levels and how to, to review the national submissions. Um, I would say that the main constraint when discussing Article 6 or other elements of the Paris is, is that you are, you are into a very kind of sensitive minefield where the political consideration, for example, countries submit their reference level, and we have some discussions of that, that there is at least a strong incentive to inflate those reference levels. And within the UNFCC, you don't have a, you should have kind of a technical review to see if all carbon pools are included, but not kind of questioning the methodology. For example, the reference period that has been used, some countries take the deforestation trend and extrapolate into the future. Is this a reasonable assumption? So I would say in this negotiations going on in this place, there, there are too many of the of the lessons learned that are kind of too sensitive to really bring into the debate. And that's kind of our role as researchers, to try to push a little bit for that and, and try to ask some critical questions. So that's what we also hope with this book. I'm getting signs that we need to wrap up. Uh, so Julie, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, put your questions later to, to us. Um, so, uh, because uh, the next group is already standing in the doors. And um, so I, I just would like to say thank you very much for being here. So this is a, a new uh, a book on Red Plus, uh, 16 chapters, 62 authors. We have been going through a very rigorous quality assessment process with uh, about 50 reviewers looking. So at each chapter has been reviewed uh, between six and eight times to make it a really short and crisp uh, and, and a good read for everybody who's not in the, in the matter so much and wants to have a quick understanding of, of what's going on, where Red Plus stands. And so please grab up a copy of, uh, in the back here on the table or find it online in uh, the C4 website, uh, Transforming Red Plus. Thanks for being here. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Yeah.